full screen or white blue. That's not true. <laughs> so um, I'm Ken Rickard, um, at Agent Rickard, which is an old Matrix joke from a long time ago. Tells about how long I've been in this industry. Uh, I work for a company called Palantir.net. It's a full-service digital agency in Chicago. Uh, but I live in Augusta, Georgia, actually. Uh, I have been around for a very long time. I'm the director of professional services, uh, which essentially means that I handle sales, marketing, account management, and all the things that go into estimating your project before it gets handed off into production. So uh, I've actually been around since Drupal 4.5, um, which is kind of exciting. That's a long time in Drupal years. Um, this is the fourth time I've been to a DC camp. They used to call it Capital Camp, now it's Go Camp. Um, it's always fun to come back here. Um, I've actually been doing this stuff professionally since 1998. That's why my nickname is a Matrix joke. Because we had to have instant messenger nicknames to communicate. Remember instant, instant messenger? All the time. Yeah, and I couldn't be Neo because I was the manager. So I'm Agent Rick. I didn't want to be Agent Smith 47. So. <laughs> So what are we going to talk about? I, I divide this talk into a couple of parts. Um, we're going to talk about what what do I think what do I think of when I think of the modern web? Right? It's 2015. You're building a website. What does that actually mean to you? Uh, what is the impact of Drupal 8 on those things? Um, and how do I prepare for a redesign? And there's a very interesting twist in the middle of this presentation that I hope you will enjoy. Um, what I'm going to do very very simply is define what we're talking about modern. Um, we're going to explore why it matters. This is the, actually the, the thing I think that uh, Angie did not do this morning, so I don't feel guilty um, going into some of the same topics. But I'm not sure she hit the why. Why is it a big deal that Drupal 8 does some of these things? So we'll talk about that, and we'll show how Drupal 8 addresses it. Uh, so with that, excuse me, with that to begin, this is going to be a buzzword-heavy conversation. I love it. Uh, but that's okay. So the modern web, I broke it into five basic parts that everybody's got to be thinking about. It's okay. We just got started. All you missed was me bragging. That's really all you missed. I wrote a book. Has anyone read Drupal 7 Module Development? You want to guess which two chapters I wrote? The good ones. Yes, that's right. I wrote, the, I wrote the chapters on security and node access. The collaborative book. It was a lot of fun to write, actually. So in the modern web, again, we're going to talk about these five things. Four of them are actually pretty easy, mobile, accessible, flexible. Secure, um, memorable is where things get tricky, and that's the big. I'll give you a hint. That's the big twist halfway through the presentation. So mobile. I think everyone understands this right now. Um, how many of you are using a smartphone while I'm talking? It's okay. It's fine. I I spent yesterday. I'm on a on day seven of a nine day road trip. I spent yesterday in my hotel room cursing because the internet was out, which meant that I couldn't use my laptop. I had to use my phone. Um, so I spent yesterday downloading Google Apps that work on the phone so I could actually get some work done. Uh, and that was fun. This, I love this fact here, though. This is why this matters. Right? This is why people talk about mobile in the web development space, because more people use mobile. This is just the United States, by the way. If you go into other parts of the world, Africa in particular, all African Internet usage is mobile. It's like 90% of African Internet usage is mobile. Right? Same thing is true in, in Asia. Um, so we're, we kind of lag in this. But this is the gateway. Right? This is where people are coming to. So if you're running a mission-critical website for the federal government, which I assume some of you are, uh, and your mobile gateway does not behave the way that people need it to, you're at a serious, serious disadvantage. You're going to have angry customers. So this is actually what Drupal 8 does. This is what Andrew was talking about earlier. I mean, this is what Drupal looks like if you load it up on a mobile phone. Right? This is just out of the box. The admin experience and actually the user experience uh, is pre-optimized for mobile, and this is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, it's going to make all of our lives a lot easier. Uh, this is what the editing screen looks like for mobile. If, I still know people running Drupal 6 websites, and they're unusable on mobile. Um, they might look good on the front end, but you cannot edit anything on your mobile device. Uh, this is, again, feasible to edit an entire article. Um, Again, just using your phone, which is, as I said, very, very nice. Um, and because, as Angie showed earlier today, they shunted some of the less important things off to the side, um, responsive design allows for those things to flow out of your way to only put the important tasks in front of you. So, I mean, that's really, really huge. And one of the other things that, that I like to talk about, because I want to sort of show off the, the group life stuff, um, this is um, responsive images, right? So you can declare 
breakpoints for image sizes without writing any code, which is really, really fun. And use uh, Drupal's built-in tools to say, okay, I have different size crops of the image that should be used at different breakpoints. The breakpoint, for those of you who aren't neck deep in the web development world, simply means the point at which you decide that you're on a different device. Oh, are you on desktop? Are you on tablet? Are you on whoops, mobile? That's a breakpoint, essentially. And so what you can do is you can, oops, I don't know, I messed up. You can tell Drupal, hey, I'm going to upload this image, but I want to use it desktop size versus uh, mobile size. And these are actual, unretouched, this is the, the actual pixel density. Right, so this is the same image, and it's been auto, automatically handled. This is really, really, really direct, right, because... In Drupal 7, if you ask me, as again, someone who does estimates, I tell you, yeah, you want off responsive images, that's going to take about a week, and we'll have that for you. Now, it's out of the box. So that's exciting. Um, the reason this is exciting, as I say, is you have no idea what device your, your audience is going to be hitting your site on. And even more frequently, your audience will hit your site on multiple devices. Typically, they'll start research on one device and finish it on another find the information they think they need, and then you know, share it to their phone, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So when we talk about flexibility, uh, this point two, and I love this series of slides because when Drupal 8 started, there was no Apple Watch. I also think this is good. A friend of mine just moved to California because her husband um, is now in charge of the logistics of making sure they have enough parts to make these watches. I'm excited for him. But the, the absolute proliferation of devices is kind of maddening if you're in the web world. Um, and it's really, really important that your CMS be flexible to that thing. The joke that I like to make, and I almost ran into somebody um, at lunch because he was walking around. Sorry. Yeah. The, the joke that I make is like the kids in a couple of years, they're just going to have like little screens in their shoes. <laughs> Right? It's going to have like turn-by-turn -turn directions in your, in, on, the, on the top of your shoe or little news alerts on the top of your shoe. Well, this kind of CMS is not good for, you don't want to load the entire CMS onto a shoe. Right? So we'll get into that a little bit. Drupal, by its nature, lets you prepare for those things that you don't know about yet. Right? You can create new content types. You can create new fields on those content types. You can create new um, display modes on those content types which tell us how do we want to display this in this certain context. And those contexts can be tied to different breakpoints, to different device sizes, um, which is really kind of fascinating. Um, so it's a little tough for me to read my own slides because it's small. Um, Andrew talked about how easy it is to do certain things in views. Um, and so we want, to put, we want to put information on a shoe and I don't want to load a lot of software into that shoe. That shoe is a lightweight JavaScript application that reads data from your website. So your, your website has to feed data to the shoe to make sure that you know, the kids in the near future don't get lost or something like that. So what you do is you literally go into views and you say, hey, I need to create a new view that outputs JSON. Um, I built this view in a minute and a half. And this is what it actually outputs. Um, and for, again, for those of you who are not developers, this is basically machine readable by almost any device. Right. It's very, very easy to write code to just read this data. And all Drupal has to do is get a request for this, send this file back. Um, this is called JavaScript Object Notation, that's what JSON stands for. Um, but this is very, very lightweight output, and it's enabled by default. Right. We were talking at lunch about what was good about WordPress versus Drupal. <laughs> One of the people who works with both said, well, WordPress doesn't have views, so it's not even close. Right. There is a, again, point-and-click builder for syndicating data across any device in the entire world baked into the application, right? So when we talk about flexibility, that's absolutely huge. So anything that we can envision, I think, coming down the pipe in the next five, ten years, right? and again, I'm thinking this is modern, this is something you have to have. You have to be able to respond to those changing conditions, right? So if you have a CMS that doesn't do something like this or doesn't give you the ability to build something like this, you're locked into the presentation modes that you have today. And being locked into a presentation mode is simply not modern, right? I also get, 
Angie did this this morning too. It's really funny how they parallel this. Um, this is the, the more you know uh, programmer heavy parts. There's also a new framework architecture, which gives us a different level of, of flexibility. And I don't need to go into what all these things mean, except for this. Drupal 8 looks much more like, I was having this conversation at lunch too, so. Drupal 8 looks much more like a Java application than Drupal 7 does. And why is that a big deal? Well, how many of you hire Drupal developers? I expected more. How many of you have trouble hiring Drupal developers? Right, it's a very, very unique skill set. The answer was, of the people who raised their hands, about 80% of them said they had trouble hiring. Um, it's a very unique skill set because Drupal doesn't look like what you're taught in school, right? And by the way, it doesn't look like that because it was created by a Java engineer in his spare time while he was in college, and PHP as a language didn't let him do Java things, so he created workarounds that kind of acted the same way, and it turned into this whole thing. And Drupal 8 has been a big refactor to make the application more modern. So the takeaway for us is that makes it much, much easier to hand Drupal 8 to a professional developer who doesn't know the system and say, okay, here's what you're dealing with. How do you extend it? And they can, they can understand it. They can read it better because it's built with these modern, modern, modern tools. Um, this is a great example of this. Uh, Andy touched on it. There are 20 external libraries baked into Drupal 8 core. Um, Guzzle is the one that I talk about. Guzzle is simply a framework for making requests to grab web pages or web data from other sources. In the pre Drupal 8 days, we had our own uh, something like 275 line function for that called Drupal HTTP request. It was awful, it was nasty, and it was bug prone. Uh, Guzzle solves that problem for us. Uh, having this enabled, is really, really powerful. I was also saying to someone at lunch, and we'll talk about this in a minute, one of the possible blockers to Drupal 8 adoption for you is that something like LDAP connectivity might not be ready for Drupal 8 yet because the LDAP module isn't, hasn't been ported. But if there's an object-oriented LDAP, uh, LDAP package already available, plugging that into Drupal becomes very, very simple. So we don't have to rewrite all that code. Uh, and that's hugely important for flexibility as we move forward. Uh, so that, yeah, like I said, we have more resources and all that. This is this is an important thing, again, about open source. How many of you would consider yourselves open source advocates where you work, by the way? So I don't have to go into that whole part. I used to do a whole big thing about that. But the huge difference between open source versus proprietary software, and the, the highlight of the New York camp I was just at, Richard Stallman came and talked. Richard Stallman is the person who invented invented the concept of the necessity of free and open software, right? He was the founder of the Free Software Foundation, and he hammered on this, right? Um, the ability to understand how the program works is fundamental to our freedom, right? As human beings, it's literally his argument. And so um, having this modern and open framework again puts us in that position. So this is actually my other favorite part of the story. Every part is talking about I love this picture, by the way. This is a Braille printed wine label. Uh, and we want to talk about accessibility. When people talk about accessibility in the web, they typically talk about the W3C's um, Section 508 guidelines. There are government regulations. Hopefully everyone in this room knows that there are government regulations about web accessibility. Um, anyone who's working on a government project has to follow them. When we talk about um, accessibility, we typically talk about four different things. Um, sight is the most common that we talk about. Um, there are also hearing impairments, there are mobility impairments, there are cognitive impairments. Um, being a dyslexic on the web is no fun. Um, having epilepsy on the web can be no fun. Um, those are cognitive challenges that people have. But I want to talk about language um, when we talk about accessibility, and I'll get to that, uh, the why in a minute. Uh, this slide always shows up better on screen than it does on on my actual computer. This is an application that we use to track sales and things. It's a CRM. And that's actually a light gray text on a light gray background that my 46-year-old eyes with, you can't believe it, but trifocals, I can't read this application. And there's no way for me to natively set the text to black instead of gray, right? This makes me irate by the way. Um, the reason that's important is I did a little bit of census research, and 
this shot, actually, uh, that orange line, and even saying an orange line, that is an accessibility problem, because not everyone here can see orange. But the line that's at the bottom left is the age cohort of people 60 and over. And you can see right now, right, it's the lowest of the four that I'm tracking here. And over the next 30 years, it becomes the highest. Right? So my frustration over illegible text, because it's too small and too light, uh, is not a minor, is not a minor issue. It's just going to get more and more important. Drupal 8 addresses this through good, solid semantic markup, um, which is a big deal for us web folks. Um, Angie talked about alt tags and things like that. Um, very, very important. This is another slide. This is actually data from New York City. I, I apologize. I did not localize this for the DC audience. Um, but when I talk about language as an accessibility barrier, um, I was a little shocked to find this. I did the numbers for Los Angeles, too, which are a little more striking in Los Angeles. The, uh, native English speakers, and people who speak English at home is like 40%. Um, it's really frightening, but frightening, excuse me, that is a horrible thing to say, uh, and I apologize for saying it. Uh, it's really striking that the percentage of English language speakers, which you would expect to be much, much higher, um, is that low, right? Now, this doesn't, this doesn't actually say that these people can't speak English, it's that they prefer not to. Right? So if we look at a place like New York and the rest of the country is you know, moving the same way, if a quarter of your audience is native Spanish speakers and you're not providing Spanish language translations, um, you're cutting off your audience. Right? And as a government agency, you're not providing the services you need to provide. Right? So when we talk about accessibility, I want to include language in that conversation. Um, and I don't have to go through this because Angie did a nice job. She actually went through the installer process. And it literally takes about a minute and a half to convert your site to being multilingual friendly, to install Drupal in a different language, or to enable it to present different translations of content. So what Drupal 8 does, for those of you who don't know, this is the administrative interface, but from an editorial side, it lets you map or, or sort of pair content and say, well, this is the English language version, and this is the Spanish language version. You'll get an overview tab that will say, well, this, this page hasn't been translated yet. And you can set up workflows for your translators who will go in and say, oh, well, this needs a Spanish version, it needs a French version, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is what that editorial screen looks like. So, OK. The other piece, and Angie did talk about that too. Wow, she took my talk. Um, accessibility for editors, right? Making good tools for editors um, so that they have it easy to do. And again, uh, getting things out of your way that you don't care about. Putting in a WYSIWYG editor that's reliable. That's a big deal for us. Um, I will skip through that. This is one that she didn't talk about that I love. I mean, this is a big deal, I think, that no one's quite exploited yet. They put a, the tour module in Core. Tour is a small JavaScript library that lets you map tooltips, basically, to different parts of the page. So Views ships with an interactive tool that teaches you how to use it. Right? And you can write custom tours for anything. Right? So you could write a custom tour module for your site to help your editors perform certain tasks. You could theoretically write a tour module to help guide your site visitors through common tasks. Right? And the interface is already done. All you have to do literally is write the text that has to go in here. Right? So I think this is a fascinating accessibility improvement. Um, yeah. From the standpoint of responsive design, so does the editor also find a way to prototype the different form factors, or is that done elsewhere? I haven't looked. The question was, does the editor allow um, you to prototype for different form factors? And I don't know the answer to that question. Angie had shown that you can preview certainly for desktop, and you could preview. She said when she said different view modes, theoretically those view modes might be tied to different breakpoints. So that might give you what you want. And if it didn't, it would be fairly easy to configure it. So it would give you the output to you want. But that's a, that is a fascinating question. So it'll come close. Uh, just in my brain, I can say, because things, you, you should have a responsive design on the front end. We do on the back end. You can literally just resize your browser. And it'll, I mean, Chrome works really well for this. So, and um, a lot of browsers, Chrome and Safari, I know, have 
um, mobile emulators baked into them. So you can say, load this page as if. Right, Safari does a pretty good job of this. Load this as if I were using iOS 7 on an iPhone. And it'll, it'll do the emulation. That's actually how I took the screenshots. Now that I, now that I remember the presentation I wrote two months ago. <laughs> um, security. We're, we're going to talk about security really, really, really quickly. Um, and when we talk about Drupal 8 adoption a little bit, I'll tell you a little bit of a story about the U.S. House of Representatives that standardized on Drupal as a platform um, back in the last uh, development cycle. Uh, the reason they did that was because of lead hack source. Um, the U.S. House of Representatives used to let all the reps run their own websites and do use whatever technology they wanted. And they had a series of high-profile Joomla hacks um, that got them in a lot of trouble. And so the sergeant at arms, who's responsible for all security, including cybersecurity, said, enough is enough. We're going to move to Drupal. It's going to be a standard and secure platform. We're going to roll it out for every single person. Remember that, because I'm going to come back to that story. In Drupal 8, the biggest thing, and Andrew mentioned this, Twig, the new templating language, doesn't allow, it escapes your content automatically, which means it gives you secure output by default, which is great because in Drupal, 90% of the security issues come from custom code written at the template level. Because in prior versions, writing, PH, writing PHP templates to do your theming required understanding PHP, and most people turns out, who are designers or front-end developers, don't know PHP, so they didn't realize if they were doing insecure things in PHP. Um, it, it's a huge problem. Twig solves that problem, which is really, really nice. Um, oh, yeah, this is config management. This is about how to tell Drupal, don't put my configuration files in a, or configuration information in a public directory, so that even if people can read it, you know, it'll get leaked. Um, that's kind of nice. Um, there are also really good ways to deploy things from server to server. It's all that config management that Angie was talking about. Um, this is what it actually looks like when you output one of those config files. So these are things that make it easier to create and maintain a secure application. Um, Drupal security actually, it, it's an interesting piece for people who aren't familiar with open source. They're like, oh, the, the, one of the historic knocks on open source is it's less secure. The fact of the matter turns out that no, it's more secure because everyone can see the code and it's much easier to find security exploits. Well, since it's easier to find them, that makes it easier to fix them. And you'd expect kind of the, the, the reverse. If it's easier to find them, it's easier to exploit them. It actually doesn't work that way, which is really great. So now we get sort of to the meat. How many of you are running on Drupal now, by the way? All right. So that's fine. Um, there are three things to consider if you're looking at how do I get onto Drupal 8 right now. Um, you can update in place. There are, as Angie mentioned, going to be tools to let you move from 6 to 8 or move from 7 to 8 by you know, replacing your code base and moving the content across. You can do a pure rebuild, which is what most people would recommend. Um, rebuild the site in Drupal 8 using the structures you want and then migrate the data that you need. Uh, that's going to be a very, very common path to this. And then you can just start over. It's actually a really, getting a new CMS, by the way, is sort of a really good excuse for starting over, right? Um, and I encourage it highly. You know, to, excuse me, sort of throw out all your old thinking, if you can, and start over. But number two is going to be the most obvious and the most popular. But that's a topic unto itself. Um, the thing that I would point out about that, and this is something we're working on to make this process easier, um, is that any of those things are going to require editorial work. Um, any kind of data migration, any time you're bringing information from one system to another, human beings are going to have to look at it. And so you're going to want to make sure your developers are building you tools to help you review that data, to help you review that content. I'll give you one simple example. Um, we did uh, foreignaffairs.com years ago. And we just redid them. Um, foreign Affairs, where American foreign policy gets written. It's actually true. Um, they gave us 14,000 XML documents, we migrated them all over. In about 100 cases, the titles to articles were in all capital letters. I have no idea if that's true, if that's correct. I have no idea if how it should be corrected. All I could do as a programmer at the time was say, hey, these things are in all capital letters. Let me tag that in a way so that we can then build you a view 
to filter that out so you can have someone go in and check those titles, right? These kinds of things. Right? I have talks about lots of things. I have an entire talk about how to plan a data migration. So if you're interested in that, I'll be here all week. Um, so what are the risks of Drupal 8? Angie touched on this a little bit. She gave you the sort of three signposts because we're still in that early adopter phase. Um, this is the new projected release date. Oh, stable. This is from uh, the 16th, so five days ago. And we're down to 12 criticals now. So we're on track, we're on track for this date. But what does that actually mean for people? Um, there are some risks um, coming. Um, API changes, this one is almost done. Uh, we're in very, very low probability of any API changes. Uh, the theming changes also, that's been fixed. Um, they are still doing security reviews in the open. That's why she gave Peter Wallan a shout out in the, in the keynote. Uh, because Drupal 8, since it's not a stable release, does not get security review. Right? Uh, it's not like Drupal 7. So there's a bounty program. If you're interested in security, uh, there's a bounty program where you can do, they will pay you to find and fix bugs. Uh, contributed module support, we can talk about that a little bit if we have time. Uh, I crossed hosting support off this list because um, in the Drupal specific space, there are three main players, and they all now support Drupal 8 since Acquia announced support for it last week. Um, what's really fascinating to me, um, this is an example of a site that's on Drupal 8. This is Memorial Sloan Kittering. Um, and I don't work for them, but our friends at Phase 2 who have a booth out here, they built this site for us. Um, one of the things that happened in the Drupal 7 cycle at this moment right where we are, where it's almost ready. I mentioned that U.S. House of Representatives project. It was being built in Drupal 7 at this point. Drupal 7 actually got released on the same day the new Congress got sworn in. Right? Because they had to push to that deadline because there's no way the Congress was going to go live on beta software. Right? There's nothing that I'm aware of right now giving that kind of push to Drupal 8. Everybody's kind of waiting for someone to say, okay, LDAP is critically important, let's do it. Right? I mean, I, I had this conversation at lunch as well, and they're like, yeah, I, I'd love to spend $50,000 to make LDAP work for everyone in the community, but that's not going to happen. And, and I made the comment, well, it would be great if there were like a single federal agency that could do that for everyone, and just everyone at the table laughed at me. <laughs> I don't know why they laughed at me, but... Um, so really, we're, we're waiting for that sort of first mover. So from an agency perspective, from a digital agency perspective, we're out there saying, look, it's ready, but. And so let's talk about risk tolerance a little bit. How many of you actually do formal risk management on your projects? Like four. OK, I'm going to teach you formal risk management in a minute and a half. This is formal risk management, basically. It's this stripped down version. All you really have to do for risk management is identify what could possibly go wrong, how likely it is to go wrong, how bad it is if it does go wrong, and who's going to make sure it doesn't go wrong. You just create a spreadsheet and, and track it. Um, you have yeah, the mitigation. There's a column missing here, excuse me, like who owns it, right? So if... Uh, the server is not built. This is the classic one in web development. You're building a new server. If it's not ready, you can't launch the site, right? So the, the, the problem is you have to delay till it's ready, and you want to make sure that Susan is in charge of making sure that that doesn't happen, right? And then as part of your project meetings every week, you just run through your risk log, and you just say, hey, how are we tracking on that issue, right? Has it come to fruition or not? This is where your Drupal 8 project is at the moment. You just have to identify the risk. For most things... And I, we do a lot of higher ed work. We do a lot of government work. If you don't need fancy single sign-on tools like LDAP or Shibboleth, you can probably build your site. If you don't need things like built-in e-commerce, it's ready. If you want, you know, just general forms and publication, it's all ready. It's a it's a risk reward question on the rest, of it. and that's what Angie was sort of getting. At. Um, this is a nice site too. This is uh, d8upgrade.org. D8upgrade.org tracks the status of contributed modules. Uh, and this is a screenshot of it. It's saying, hey, does this have a Drupal 8 release unit? So you can actually track what's necessary for your site. Um, what's really, really fascinating, of course, is that because of the way Drupal 8 has added views to core 
and then a couple other things under the hood, there are certain contributed modules you simply don't need anymore. Uh, one of the nice things from a developer perspective is that, uh, Angie hinted at this, we now have a unified API for anything that might be considered content. That means that nodes and users and comments and blocks all behave the exact same way under the hood. But finally, after eight long years, yeah. Um, what that means is you don't actually need the node queue module anymore because if you need to make a list of uh, editor's picks, you can just build a block and that block can have a node reference field on it and the editor can just go in and edit that block and make that selection, right? So node queue is no longer a barrier to upgrading, right? It's just not a module dependency. And I, I like that example because I said I've been around since 4.5. Node queue was the first module that I would have written had it not existed. And it literally was released three days before I needed it. So I'm very, very happy about that. So we talked about this into this why open source bit. Um, and again, this is a big deal. And even though a lot of you are open source advocates, this is why. Right? Even with the risk, this is what's important. Right? Wasted time, wasted effort. We're not sharing. Um, Richard Stallman, I'll paraphrase, would basically say, as, as a government agency, if you're not using free software, you're not using software that you have control over the code, and you can read the code, and you can redistribute the code, um, that you are failing in your duty as public servants. Uh, he, he's kind of hardcore about it. I recommend looking up some of his arguments. But this is, I mean, this is a CDO. This is Red Hat, the biggest distributor of Linux systems in the world, talking about how companies can save money by going open source. There's a talk, I think it's later today, I hope it's not concurrent with mine, um, by one of our friends from, I think from previous next down in Australia, how the entire Australian government has standardized on Drupal as a platform. And it's really, really fascinating, the work that they've done. So, I had 12 minutes left. I said we were going to get out early. I was wrong. Well, we'll have time. So, after I say all those things, and remember that I am a technology service provider, right? I used to be a developer. I connect you to developers. I help you write software. I help you deploy code and projects and things. And, and I'm here to tell you this is the big switch in my conversation. None of you have an actual technology problem think you have a technology problem, but you probably don't. Um, Drupal 8 is very good. So are many other systems. Uh, the advantage that Drupal may have largely fall to it's open, right? It's free to use, um, and you can use it as you wish. But the selection of the CMS is not the most critical part of your project. Um, it's actually a minor, minor thing because the technology in all of this space is all commodity. There are software as a service tools that you can buy if you want to create JSON feeds, right? You can just rent them for like $10 a month, create all the JSON feeds you want. There are all kinds of things out there. The technology is commodified. And the danger that I always sort of warn people about, I love this photo, uh, because I used to work in the newspaper industry and we used to wax coat things for some reason. And this woman is lying to you because she looks so happy. She looks so happy because she has a new tool, and the new tool solves all her problems and makes her job beautiful. And that's just not true, right? We tend to have a technology fetish. We think, we think that if we just get this piece of software, if we just get this one thing, our jobs will become magically easier. And that's, the again, the big shift in my talk. I'm here to tell you that that's just a lie. Um, this is Mark Bolton. Mark Bolton designed the administrative theme for Drupal 7, which we still use. Uh, and I love this quote. I don't have to read it to you, I don't think. But yeah, the sheer amount of effort spent on technical solutions of CMS implementation when you ignore the actual people problem. Um, that's what you have. You have a people and a resource problem. Do you have enough developers? Do you have enough trainers? Do you have enough editors? You have the people with the skills that you need to get the job done. Do you know clearly who has authority over things? For those of you who weren't in Brian, Brian Hirsch from Acquia gave a session earlier where he had surveyed in advance the entire audience and he asked them, you know, how many of you run agile processes? And I think the answer was like 80%. And 
of those people, right, how many of you have a firm project product owner? And the product owner is the one who's authorized to make decisions. And the answer was like, eh, well, like 40%. So you're trying to do agile, but you're not. You don't have the right people in place. You don't have the right tools in place. Um, it was really fascinating stuff. So what you need is to set mileposts. You need to set um, some structure and some rules around how engagements work. And this is one of the big things that, um, and there are organizations in the government helping with this. There are agencies you can hire to help with this. Uh, I had dinner last night with a client of ours who was really happy with our work. Largely because before they engaged us, they engaged a consultant to set out these milestones and set out how the project should run to make sure that you know, we were staying on track and not were misleading, which is an interesting thing for me to say. So that all to say, the technology is great. It's there. It's ready. Um, the message that the Drupal community does want you to hear is that Drupal 8 is ready for your project. We're anxious to use it. We're happy to use it. It is not, however, going to help you with the most critical parts. The most critical parts are internal governance. Right? Um, how many of you, by the way, know what the workbench module is? Yeah, we, we wrote that. Um, and we wrote that because we deal with a lot of organizations that have things like 2,000 editors who need to contribute to the website. Uh, I actually wrote the workbench access part, which is the bit that says, oh, you work for the Department of Homeland Security you're in the group that can edit content related to airports, and you're in the group that can edit content related to trains. Right? Um, that's a governance issue that has then been translated into technology. And it, it's a, a fascinating problem because I was talking to one of our engineers over the weekend, and she said very, very clearly, you know, I need to understand what problems you're trying to solve internally and externally. I need to understand your business. Because I'm actually writing, I'm not programming for you. I'm not building your website. I'm building you a business machine, right? You have to have outcomes that you expect. You have to have actions you want people to take. You know, I mean, I don't want to pile on it, uh, pick on someone, but healthcare.gov failed at launch because its entire job was to let people purchase healthcare, and they couldn't. Right? That was the entire point. I think six people on day one, and it was a whole thing, and they fixed it. But you have to know what the business logic is. So you can't be memorable unless you know that. So the reason I want to give this talk, actually, is that I work for an agency. We come and we help people with this sort of thing. But too often, people think they know that the technology will solve their problem. If we just come in and implement it, it'll be fine. And too often, technology firms will come in and sell it that way. I'm actually trying to close a deal right now, and it's Drupal versus a proprietary software vendor. And the proprietary software vendor is basically selling a wax coder and a happy smile, saying, we know how your business works. This solves all your problems. You'll be fine. And we're saying, we'd like to see, I actually said this to them, I'd like to see how your current CMS works. I'd like to sit with one of your employees for the day and make notes and listen to them complain and ask them to do normal tasks and see what's easy and see what's hard and see what they like and see what they don't. And then we'll craft something that is a workflow that's you know, effective for them. And wireframing and all of that stuff is critically important to it. Um, going through you know, color palettes, marketing, all of these foundational pieces. <laughs> this same client who wants us to build a, a website in a hurry wanted me to Eliminate design from their budget. Like, we don't need any design. <laughs> That's a warning sign. Right? But this is how we do design, by the way. In modern web development, this is design. We don't design pages in Photoshop anymore. I could tell you horror stories about designing in Photoshop. We design components. We have another entire presentation about why this is important. Um, sorry? What do we use to design pages? Um, we break them into constituent components. So you will have like, what do lists look like? What do titles look like? What do images look like next to text? Um, what you, you, you'll design like your navigation, but you'll have parts, and then you'll assemble the parts. Because what's, what matters when you're, using a, when you're using a content management system is that you have a systemic approach to your design object. That you're not just doing, um, oh, it looks good in this context, but not in this other context. 
It, there's a talk, it's called Design Systems for Drupal. Uh, we gave it at DrupalCon LA, we gave it at Nice Camp, um, and I can find it, and if I, when I update this page, I can try to put a link on it so you can find it. But it's a whole thing, design, and we're not the only ones who do it. Yeah, I'm keeping an eye on the clock in four minutes. How easy is it if you design a component a certain way and then you change your mind and like to have it appear differently? Is it easy to apply that across the entire site? Yeah, so the question was, if you design a component, let's say it's a list, right? A simple list with, a, with an image, like title and image. How easy is it to change that component across the entire site? If you're doing it properly and using what they call smacks, or in the Drupal space, a lot of them use, use a thing called BEM, which is a system for how you name and organize style sheets. Uh, it's really simple because everything is broken into those components and you only have to change it once, right? right? So we will do that. I mean, we prototype things. I mean, it's interesting. The question was, how do we, how do we design things? Well, we do them in little components and then we build pages with the components. And then we review them with clients and say things like, well, it would be better if this type was a little bit bigger. Well, you make that change in one location in your style sheets, and boom, the promise of CSS working the way they told us it would 15 years ago finally comes true. Sorry, that was a geek joke. Um, user stories, too. This is this is something else. Please, I, I beg of you, when, we, when you hire an agency and they come to you and they say, can you please explain your business goal? A lot of times people get mad. They're like, but we told you what they were. They're in the RFP. No, we want you to articulate them. We want to be able, and more importantly, we need to be able to articulate them on your behalf. Right? We do an exercise, this is actually part of it, called I Like, I Wish, I Wonder. Right? Like, what do you like about your current site? What do you wish it could, could what do you wish that it could do? What do you wonder would happen if? And we use this as a planning tool to prioritize work. Again, for those of you, you know, dealing with in the Agile space, and Agile practice, this kind of exercise becomes really, really helpful in crystallizing the importance of certain things. We did this exercise uh, for the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. There were 25 people in the room, one of whom was in charge of major donor grants, had never met anyone else in the room, and no one understood her job. And at the end, she was like, I wonder what would happen if, and they all had this like, light bulb went off. Because we were sitting in a $250 million brand new conference center that someone had just paid for, right? Through the major donor gift department. And they hadn't even thought about her department in their redesign. Uh-huh, there's a big, hmm, yeah. So getting the right people to the table and facilitating. It's not rework, and it's not designed to be saying that you did it wrong. It's important for the people you're working with to be able to collaborate with you. And so this is part of it. Um, Personas, 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 personas. You have to know and define and be able to state who's using your site, what are they after. So you create, you know, representations of people who might interact with you. What does Mary need? And then you can ask when it comes time to have that lovely conversation about budget and schedule, because you're you're going to run long or you're going to run over budget. You can say, well, does Mary really need this feature? So being able to state that is critically, critically important. And again, this is, in, in many cases, if you do your project right, the answer to this question will drive your technology choice. Right? Because it's true, Drupal might be too much. You might not need it. Right? So, I'm going to write on time. My takeaways. Things to remember when you're talking about making the sites memorable. The web is everywhere. Right? People are still using it in this room. I can see at least 20 people actively on the internet right now. That's fine. Um, the audience is terribly fragmented. We talked about the language difference in the United States and the growth of you know, multilingual folks or people who speak different languages at home. But just the, you know, the, um, there's cultural differences, there's regional differences, there's device differences. Fragmentation is a huge issue that you have to take into, into a, uh, account. Oh, I love this is a DC photo. Yay! The audience is ridiculously distracted. Right? Everybody in the metro is doing 16. Is that the metro? I think it is. Yeah. For a minute, I thought it was uh, somewhere. No, because it's no Yeah. 
I've had very good luck with the DC train system, except for the fact that a day ticket doesn't mean 24 hours. Surprise! Surprise! The, the nice man in Bethesda who I yelled at let, let me go anyway, and then I apologized because I yelled at the nice man. And I didn't get in until like 11 o'clock Monday night, and my day ticket expired an hour and a half later. <laughs> Machines don't, the machines don't tell you that. Um, our job, your job, everybody's job, healthcare.gov's job is to focus attention. You make sure that you have clearly defined what your goals are so that when people try to interact with you, they can make that happen. I apologize for running one minute long, but that is the end. If you have any questions, I will be here all week. You can contact me there. Thank you very much.